Welcome to our new Sports Talk ATL Hawks podcast called Squawk Talk. I'm your host, Chase Earl, and I'm joined by Jay, Jay, or Jay, Jeffrey and Christian. We've already begun our Falcons podcast here at Sports Talk ATL, Talk and Birdie, so if you haven't checked that, checked that one out, please do. And I thought, what better time to get the Hawks one started than right now with the Hawks playing the Knicks? First playoff matches since 2017, and we get the New York Knicks, who haven't been here since 2013, the national media darlings. Uh, Christian, I guess I just wanted to start off with you. We're going to be covering this whole series throughout this whole episode, and I'm sure we'll have episodes in the middle of the series. Um, what are your initial thoughts on this series? What are you looking forward to? you got two scorching hot teams that nobody expected to be here, and I cannot wait for Sunday. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, initial thoughts, definitely uh, pretty interesting that uh, the Knicks and Hawks are in the 4-5 while uh, Boston was fighting to stay alive in the play-in. Um, you look at a lot of these teams, you know, before the season, uh, looking at Vegas win projections beforehand, the Hawks, 34 wins. You had the Knicks at 21, um, even less than that in some places. I saw a Bleacher Report article laughing about the Knicks saying, you know, that, uh, that they wouldn't expect them to get more than 13. I think the Hawks were not expected, but it's not like a crazy thing that they made it this far. Um, and I think they had to make some improvements, uh, you know, over last year, but, I mean, the Knicks especially just out of nowhere. Uh, I don't think anybody expected the Knicks to be anywhere near here. Um, pretty cool, obviously, having having these two teams, uh, two big markets. I'm tired of Atlanta being considered a small market. There's a lot of people here. Yeah, I'll um, tell them that, Christian. Yeah, I'll exactly. I'm going to get screamed at now by, <laughs> by New York fans. Obviously, New York's a little bit bigger market than Atlanta, but a lot of people down here like basketball. And it's just, it's just good to have playoff basketball back in the city. It's been a while. Yeah, I mean, like you said, I think – at least us as Atlanta fans, I think we all three probably would have said at the beginning of the season, hey, we're making the playoffs. But I don't think even the most optimistic Nick fans were like, hey, man, we're going to be the five seed this year. So I think right. that's the difference between those two teams. I think a big yeah. storyline here is kind of like the revitalization of like the Tom Thibodeau. I mean, a couple years ago, it was like, why is this guy still getting head coaching jobs? You know, he hasn't been good since Absolutely. the Bulls. And now he goes to the Knicks and turns this group of poor men into like the the four seed in the East, they have home court in the first round. I mean, I think you could have won a lot of money betting on that. Uh, obviously, you have <laughs> Julius Randle, who's been killing the Hawks. Uh, the, they beat us three times in the regular season. I mean, I'm going to go ahead and say you just throw that out. Two of those with Lloyd Pierce. One were up by 10, and Trey Young gets injured when we're, um, late in the third quarter, I think it was. Uh, right. So, but, but these are two of the hottest teams in the NBA. I think they have the second and third best records going into uh, since April 1st. Uh, so I think it's going to be a great matchup, and it's two. It's a great stylistic matchup. You have the Knicks, who are basically uh, the number one defense, and then you have the high flying Hawks, who since they've gotten healthy, have been able to put any defense into a you know a meat grinder and just absolutely make them look silly. So I think it's a great matchup, and I and I listen. I think we all can agree. I know me and JJ talked about it over the weekend. You know, I'm tired of being disrespected, so I'm ready to play a team yeah. like the Knicks. I think we got. I think we got a good opponent that we can like really, you know, prove ourselves. And, and I, I think we have a, like not just win this series. I think we can you know, make a statement and that, that we might be able to go further past the first round. I'm definitely excited. Yeah. Uh, we're back in the playoffs. It's been a while since we guys playoff basketball. Uh, the stylistic matchup differences, like you said, that's a big thing. I think I'm interested in seeing with this series, uh, just us offensively with all our pieces, finally healthy at once. Interested to see how that comes and matches up against Tibbs with Tibbs can, you know, make lineup adjustments kind of, can grind like he wants to grind as a coach. And definitely, you mentioned the uh, revitalization of Tibbs. It's also interesting to see the revitalization of Nate McMillan. Kind of trashed his uh, scrap heat last year. Comes in 27-11 as the head coach. So definitely interested to see kind of if he's able, capable to kind of rewrite the narrative he has of being this guy who can come to teams. They can kind of upgrade to some during the regular season. Playoff time doesn't show up. Go out in four or five. Yeah, but you look at those Pacer teams. I mean, those teams were all overachieving and, and mm -hmm. going into the playoffs. I mean, they didn't. They had no business being four or five seeds. They were playing teams that were significantly better than them. I think he's on the other end of that spectrum now. Now he doesn't have to outcoach his opponent to win. I think now he just has to, you know, do what he does. He has the more talented team in the Hawks, and I, and I think that narrative is going to go out the window because this is probably the most talented group in his whole coaching career, which is long. I mean, he's been coaching for twenty. 
plus years. I think this is the most talented group he's probably had. And, and I think they're ready to make some noise. And I, I don't believe Nate McMillan's a guy who doesn't know what he's doing in the playoffs or can't make adjustments. I mean, I think ever since he took over, obviously we're 27-11, but there's been so many times where you're watching the game and you actively see like, where he was making changes that Lloyd Pierce wasn't. You know, the rotations, the the plays off the end ground. I mean, speaking of just against the Knicks, I remember we're down seven or we're down, we're down three, you know, seven seconds left. He calls that play to the corner for bogey. I mean, those are just things that great coaches right. do. I mean, that was a yep. great, great play call. And yeah, like he's not wide open, but you take like they're going to be defending the three point line. The fact that he was even able to get a kind of open shot in that situation, that's just great drawn up play design. And those are things you just weren't seeing with Lloyd Pierce. He didn't have that in his bag. And, and, I, and I believe, you know, I don't I don't think, you know, Nate McMillan was a choker. I just think he was outmatching those series. And I think he will prove that this series. Yeah, you know, the thing about uh, this series is LeBron is not lining up for the Knicks. <laughs> and, and a lot of times that was what was, uh, you know, kind of given McMillan issues, of course. You know, you said that about talent. You know, the funny thing is on paper, you kind of think these teams are pretty similar. You know, they got a high usage star that kind of takes them where they want to go. And in and, and a lot of ways, you know, this is being billed as Trey versus Julius Randle. And it is, and it very well can come down to which star plays better. However, the thing about the Hawks is uh, they have three players that are better than the Knicks' second best player. Um, I mean, you're talking about Clint Capella, John Collins, and Bogdanovich, especially now. Um, you know, since he's come alive here in the second half on paper and talent wise, I absolutely think, you know, the Hawks are the more talented team and, you know, it's going to take a, a heck of a coaching job from Thibodeau to, <laughs> to slow them down. Uh, he's capable of it. I mean, he, he's had a, he's had a pretty successful run this year. And obviously in the past, he's, he's been a pretty, pretty daggum good coach. Um, however, I, I think that overall, you know, the Hawks just have a lot of talent that, uh, that Knicks don't, um, frankly, and, and, and that's going to come to play in this series and, uh, yeah, I mean, that's kind of where I stand, you know, on the two teams kind of match up. Yeah, so speaking of that disrespect, and I'm going to turn to Jeffrey after I bring this up. Uh, you know, the media bias, uh, it, you know, everyone wants the Knicks to win. Nate McMillan brought that up. He gets fined $25,000. I have no idea why, because it's super obvious that, you know, the national media, the league, everybody wants the Knicks to win. I mean, if I am if I wasn't a Hawks fan, I'd want the Knicks to win. You know, I think it's kind of right. cool. And the, the league is better when the Knicks are better. I like the Knicks being good. When I had a 2K team, I didn't, I didn't send my guy to the Hawks. I was playing in Madison Square Garden. So I get it. <laughs> like, I firsthand understand, you know, why the, the league would want the Knicks to win, why outside people would want the Knicks to win. They ain't lying. Like, Nate McMillan was speaking straight facts. He gets fined 25 k by the league, which to me, like we spoke before the show, does that show like maybe the league is leaning toward the Knicks, but the media bias is shown in this ESPN article where 14, you know, guys, 14 out of 16 picked the Knicks to win this series. Even one guy had the Knicks in five. I don't know what that guy's smoking, but I need some of that. Uh, Jeff, you know, let's talk about this because we talked about this a lot this weekend. You know, the disrespect about this team and, and, and why you think this is just, that's just preposterous. Yeah, I mean, like you can kind of tell the way the, the way the media's been shaping up this week, the way they've been talking about it, that 14 to 16 kind of pick range, you could see like guys haven't watched this play all season. Or if they did, they watched this play kind of early in the year and kind of wrote us off, wrote us off. Because I mean, just like teams with like the statistical profiles that we both have, so similar, there's just no way you can look at that and be like, hey, you know, these teams, same point differential, same record, same everything, played three games, all close games, even if the Knicks won all three, and legitimately say, hey. Yeah, it's Knicks across the board. This is easy, simple. Or like even just looking kind of roster, as uh, Christian mentioned earlier, looking at the rosters kind of on paper. Yeah, they got they got Randall. You can and you can argue that Julius Randall's the best player in the series. Then kind of going down on yeah, paper, you, know, you got Trey. That, I'd argue against that, but I mean, if you want to say that, that's I fine. think he might be the most overrated player in the NBA right now. I really do. <laughs> like he has lit up the Haw no. I mean seriously, he's lit up the Hawks. But I was looking at like the stats, the statistics. You know, you know, per. Uh, win shares, uh, Raptor by 538. And listen, the Hawks have guys better in every single statistics. And sometimes it's two or three guys, not just one. So yeah, like from Hawks fans perspectives, we might be seeing, and like he, he, he has been on a tear. Don't get me wrong. And I, and I think he's yes. going to be a beast in the playoffs to defend. And I think that's got to be the number one priority. So I'm not trying to say, but I think because he's in New York, like People talking like this guy's an MVP candidate. Like, come on, bro. Like, stop that. Like, we're not even like he's not. I, I like. 
I don't I I haven't gone through it, but I don't even know if he's he's definitely not top five player in the East. Like, is he top ten? Like, I, I think it's <laughs> right. Real, I, I like is that sure. like so we're acting like this guy's like gonna be able to take over the game like LeBron. Like, yeah, he did that in the regular season, but wait till Nate McMillan has a week to prepare for you, has a week to develop a game plan. He knows where the Knicks' weaknesses are and like see how he does. I think they can really hold him under the the you know, I mean, he's gonna get his. Like I say he averages over twenty four a game like he did in the season, but he ain't gonna average thirty seven and twelve and six like he did against the regular season. <laughs> that ain't happening. So, right. you know, like, is he the best player on the floor? I don't know. Like, I think Trey Young's going to get his, like, 13 assists, 25 points. Like, I, like you give me that over Julius Randle. I think, you know, a lot of a lot of Julius's kind of, like, love and praise is we – I know it, it's the Knicks and they're the big market, but they are kind of an underdog story. And they're a, kind of a combination of an underdog story as well as in that big market that everyone wants to see be great. And That's, absolutely. Julius, you know, he was drafted by the Lakers – he had this big, you know, kind of potential when he was taken, and he's never really lived up to it. You know, he's been fine, and he, you know, he's had some success, but you know, I think it's a lot more fun to picture Julius Randle of all people leading the Knicks on this magical run, and that he is actually this good. I think seventy-two games, while it's a lot, it's still, you know, a, a fairly small sample size to already be claiming that Julius Randle is one of the five to 10 best players in the NBA. I think I heard listening to Zach Lowe not too long ago, talking about how you could argue Julius Randle first team all NBA at forward. I don't yeah, think I mean, that, that the guy you can do been, that. I mean, Zach Lowe, I really respect him, but that's ridiculous. I mean, like, yeah, he, and, guy, he, and again, Zach's awesome. I think he does. ER. <laughs> right. Uh, less than a it's 20 just, PER. Like, what are we talking about here, dude? Uh, I, I don't yeah, uh, I mean I, I, I don't even know what to say there. Like, that's just absolutely <laughs> absurd. That's watching 10, right. 10 Knicks games where he went off, which like they're definitely there. But I mean, I'm like, I'm sure there's Knicks games because I, I obviously don't watch the Knicks every night, but I'm sure there's Knicks games where he's off as hell because he takes a lot of bogus ass shots. I mean, a lot of them. And like they just be raining in against the Hawks. But like I'd like to see it over seven games if he's going to be raining in these fadeaway threes and fadeaway jumpers from the corner from long two. Like those are bad jump shots, and those aren't the kind of shots the Hawks are going to be taking. And that's why I like them in this series. Like the Hawks are going to get theirs offensively. I know the Knicks have a great defense, but as long as Trey Young stays healthy, you can't guard him with one people, one person. And, and, and if you can't guard him with one person, he's going to find the open man. I'm also really intrigued to see – I guess media not talk about it too much, but like how much more like can the Knicks turn it up anymore? Like during the playoffs? Cause I mean, the way they play right. this balls to the walls all the time, just like what Randall leads the league in min- leads the league in minutes. You got like RJ playing the second most minutes in the league. Like, and these guys, uh, like I said, it's just lunch pail going hard all the time. Yes. I don't see what, I don't see like how much more, I don't see what they can more, more they can get out of right. themselves than they have and so far this year. And that's prototypical Tom Thibodeau. I mean, that's how he's been that's coaching been his, his book, whole yeah. career. You know, the the Bulls were winning sixty games when they clearly weren't the best team in the league. So I mean, and I and I think that's a that's a big point. I, I kind of thought about that in this series. I'm like, there's regression to be had in the Knicks. I don't think there's any progression. Like I I don't think Julius is going to average thirty and ten and twelve a whole series. Like. I'm looking at RJ, and I really like RJ. I wanted the Hawks to move up to draft him. I was really hoping that was who we were trading up for. But like the Knicks were smart and drafted the best player. Um, I'm like, is he really like, is he really that dude yet? I mean, in his second year, I don't know if he's that dude, and he has to be that dude if they're going to win this series. Right. Um, Derrick Rose, I think, is the one piece that I'm that I'm scared about. I think Derrick Rose has that experience, and, and he's gonna he's gonna be cold blooded. I do believe that. I think that's their clear number two guy in this series. Um, but, but I see, look at everyone else. I mean, they shot 40% from three and they still this year, that's third in the NBA. And they still only average, I think what, 102 points a game. I mean, that's ridiculous. Like if the Hawks shot 40% for three as a team, I mean, we're averaging 125. Like, so I do wonder, like, is there room, like you said, for progression with this unit? I, I see a lot of room for regression, especially since role players typically shrink in the playoffs instead of, you know, rise up. And yeah, oh, like absolutely. You're saying, I think no. Go ahead, JJ. Like you're saying, you got guys like Randall and RJ shooting forty something percent from three this year. Like I'm just Their whole like team is like yeah, I looked at it. Today, is, I was shocked. Like, right. I, was I just shocked. don't see that being sustainable. No, I I don't either. I mean Reggie Bullock, uh, uh, 
what's him call it? What's his name? Quinkly or whatever. I can't even. I forget it. Manual Quickly. Yeah. yeah. Quickly. Yeah. Quickly. I mean, he's shooting thirty nine percent from the field and forty percent from three. Like what? <laughs> you know, like how sustainable is that? And, and I, I don't know if it is. I remember in a lot of the, the few Hawks games that we had against the Knicks, the Hawks played some of the worst three point defense um, that I've seen them play. I, I imagine a lot of that had to do with being, you know, on the road or you know maybe not as focused. Hopefully that's not the case again. I know that's been a problem for the Hawks at times over the year. But I do think um, that's something that has to be a focus on this team because if, if you can stop, if you can slow down Randall and defend the three-point line, I, I don't see how the Knicks have a chance. They don't really have a low post president, especially with Ro- uh, you know Robinson probably not going to play. Uh, they, I mean, so who's getting the bulk of the minutes down there? Um, outside of Randall, I don't really know who, who you're, you're threatened by back down there. They're a three and D team. That's that's what they live on. They're first in three point, uh, or first third and three point shooting, first in defense and defense, and that's what they do. Which that wins in the NBA during the regular season, but I'm not sure they have enough firepower to really last into the playoffs. You know the thing you said that about three point defense with the Knicks, and while they do get a lot of contests, and while they did have they obviously gave up a very low percentage, a lot of that is just. Guys have had off nights against the Knicks over the course of the season. And, you know, shooting and three-point shooting in general is a team stat we've kind of seen over the years. There is a good bit of luck that, you know, does actually end up getting involved in that because, I mean, even over 72 full games, I mean, the Knicks the Knicks has caught a lot of teams on off nights. And I don't see a team like the Hawks, you know, the Knicks are giving up the 10th most threes per game in the NBA. They clearly have a big emphasis on making the team, other teams shoot threes. I don't see with guys like, Bogdanovich and Kevin Herter, uh, DeAndre Hunter, if the shooting was completely real from the beginning of the season. Um, Gallinari, of course, Trey Young, John. I mean, the Hawks have guys that can expose that open three point line if they're going to give it to them. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. And uh, it's just going to be a matter of, you know, if the Hawks can hit their shots and the Knicks are going to let them take them. I mean, they're going to get their shots up because the Knicks Uh, ultimately are going to allow that. It's just, you know, the Hawks can hit them. I guess a like a stat I saw earlier today that I liked, and I was like, I don't think it's going to be sustainable in this series. In the regular season matchup we had with them, like the Knicks were shooting forty eight percent from three, we were shooting thirty three percent from three. I'm like, there's no way we're going to go into seven game series with all those guys shoot thirty three percent from three. And like, mind you, with all that, like all three games we played in the regular season were close games. So if something like that balances out a little bit, like yeah, I just don't see, games. yeah, yeah, close games with Julius Randle going Dropping off like, like forty, yeah, yeah, forty every game. So. <laughs> I mean, that's what it take, took to beat him in the regular season. And as we, as I said, you got to throw those games out because two of them were with uh, two of them were with Lloyd Pierce. One of them we probably should have won until Trey Young gets injured. And I think they shot fifty something in that game that they beat so us. I think it was nineteen uh, to thirty five last. Yeah, it was yeah, some. It was something three. ridiculous. So yeah, I mean, uh, we'll see. Uh, this this you get a seven game series, you really get to see you know what two teams are made about. And I'm I couldn't be more confident. I know fourteen, which is why it's it's crazy that 14 out of 16 people are picking against us. But I want to like maybe rewind and talk about like the advancements in the Hawks under Nate McMillan. I know we kind of talked about it a little bit, but you know, 27 and 11 against them best uh, second best record in the NBA since April 1st uh, home warriors won 11 in a row. I think we're 15 or 16 and two at home with him. So, I mean, good luck coming into state farm unless you're playing your best and winning that game. Uh, you know, Bogdanovich has obviously thrived under him. 18 points, almost a 50, 40, 90 player since McMillan took over. We're finally getting healthy. I mean, we finally get DeAndre Hunter. He played 25 minutes. Uh, I think he's probably going to be good for 30. And then at the end of the series, I think it's probably, as, as long as nothing happens, he's probably all systems go. I mean, the depth on this team, I mean, we're not even playing guys that a lot of people, like a lot, the Knicks probably play Chris Dunn all the time. They're probably playing players like that. These guys are sitting on the bench. like maybe, They're not even getting the warm-ups off. You know, just not happening. And I think the one thing you have to say, give all this credit to, is Travis Schlank, who has just done a fantastic job of building a really, really, really deep team. You know, we had the stars, but, uh, you know, the Lou Williams edition at the trade deadline, loved that. I know he hasn't been great, but, I mean, he's provided way more than Rondo. Gallinari and Bogey have really turned it on in the second half of the year. Hunter is Cameron do his own. Um, and most of his draft picks have just hit. I mean, so I think he's done a fantastic job of building this team. And I think, I think you know, people are going to realize that, you know, this isn't a joke. I mean, you don't win. The, you don't go on these kind of streaks in the NBA, especially when you need these wins, unless you're legit. 
Oh, absolutely. Uh, you know, you mentioned that at the start of this, you know, about Nate McMillan specifically. You know, one of the things we kind of talked about at the beginning was about, you know, after timeout kind of plays. Uh, I Obviously, we've all been, you know, following the Hawks for a while. I remember back in the Bud days, it almost felt like an automatic. If the Hawks had a timeout, they were going to come out and get two points or three points. Um, you know, there was some disorganization, I think, under Lloyd Pierce. I, I always found it strange. Uh, I know he had a young team. I know we had guys in and out. But I did find it strange that multiple times he had kind of come out and mentioned how he hadn't put in his defense fully yet. Um, Especially you know, when he came in as a defensive coach. Like that's that's what he was heralded <laughs> as. Right. I was like, and what? <laughs> I think – and and if your defense is – if your defense, which is – if your defense is so complicated that after two years, you know, the core guys still – you can't fully put it in, you're probably not – you probably shouldn't be running that <laughs> in the NBA. So <laughs> I think, you know, you mentioned that about Bogdanovich. You know, obviously, uh, I saw Chase, you know, you put it in the notes about the, uh, the interview with The Athletic. Um, you know, obviously they do a great job over there covering the Hawks and – uh, you know, Bogdanovich, one of the things you mentioned, just they're more organized. I mean, Nate McMillan, th- there's a difference between being a good coach and understanding X's and O's and then coaching guys. And I think Nate McMillan actually, you know, inspires these guys and keeps it simple. Travis Sling said over and over, they just keep it simple. And they let his, he lets his talent operate in a system that maximizes them without overcomplicating things. And, you know, having a guy like Inyeka Kongwu to where he's a rookie in the NBA, he has no offseason, but by the end of the year, he's playing really good basketball because it's just right there in front of him. And I think Nate's done a great job. I, I can't say more about how, you know, obviously as a fan, uh, grateful I am that Nate came in when he did. And because uh, me and Chase were texting right around that before that, and uh, we, were, we were not having kind words about That's the Hawks <laughs> way back then. <laughs> but yeah, Nate, I mean, I think Nate's done a phenomenal job, of course. Yeah, it's an yeah, amazing I mean, thing. Oh, go no, ahead, go ahead. Go ahead. No, no. Oh, I, I was just gonna say it's just an amazing thing what like structure can do for a team. Just like right. simple, yeah, simplifying things. Because I mean that whole Lloyd, you kind of roll the ball out, do what you want, high pick and roll, or Trey high pick and roll, go from there. Everybody else is standing around in the corner, using guys like Bogdanovich as strictly spot up shooters, and then kind of you know just McMillan coming in here, making some tweaks here and there, get a little structure, get guys moving off ball. But now we look like a legitimate top five offense in the league. <laughs> It's right. like, yeah. I mean, it's not much more you could ask for. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, I'll just kind of like out, like punch myself in the face uh, that uh, I actually, at, I remember the beginning of the uh, the Nate McMillan move. I, I, I like, cri- I didn't criticize. It. I just said, <laughs> you know, this shit, this shit ain't gonna change shit. You know, <laughs> we got problems. We got issues. You had some and people pretty be- angry at you on the main account. I remember. Yeah, <laughs> I was yeah, I did. Out. Uh, yeah, I did. I got ratio, you know, they, they weren't happy with me, but I was like, you know what? I'm just telling you how I feel. I just don't believe it. I don't believe Lloyd Pierce was the problem. I think it's just like slapping a bandaid over, you know, something that needs your stitches. But uh, I was wrong. I mean, I was absolutely wrong. It was very simple fixes. And like you said, uh, Lloyd Pierce was kind of a free flow, do whatever you want offense, really trade dependent on creating everything and using everyone as spot up shooters and, you know, just pick, yeah, just pick and roll. That's, that was the whole offense free flow. You know, they just start doing a few things and like, boom, it just, it just changed overnight. And really over the last, you know, five, six weeks of the season, I mean, it just kind of feel like every game we went in there and I was like, damn, we don't like, we can win. Like, I don't care who we're playing. Like we really can. I mean, the only, I mean, and, and, and the injuries too. I mean, finally getting healthy, finally getting some chemistry, uh, it's been amazing, you know, how quickly that's happened because that that doesn't happen fast. Usually, it takes six weeks or you know two months at the beginning of the season. The Hawks never had that. You know, they learned on the fly in the last you know six to eight weeks with this group finally healthy, and it's been impressive. And I think you have to have a fantastic coach to keep that team together, especially where we were at. I think fourteen and twenty. Uh, it, it's really impressive, and uh, you know because of that, you know, I want all the smoke. Like I'm ready. Like who wants it? Who wants it, dog? Like, <laughs> like who wants it? Like, the Knicks can get it. They're going to get it easy. But I want Philly, <laughs> Brooklyn. Like, let's go. <laughs> I don't know about that one, but I know what you're saying. I'm um, just saying, like, I'm just not – like, I feel confident. Of course. Like, we'll at least play well. Like, we're not – like, the other teams the Hawks had in the playoffs, like, I'd lie to myself and be like, come on, we can beat LeBron. Like, yeah, like, come on. Like, Kyle Korver, <laughs> Kyle Korver, five all-stars. What's up? But like this is real. Like they are like player of the this, month. <laughs> this is the first time. This is the first time, you know, like we have a superstar. Like we like when you have a superstar right. in the playoffs, you can win uh, any game. 
Like if Trey Young drops 40 on your head, he's we're probably going to win. And he can do that. We've never had a player like that since I've been alive. So that's really why I'm so excited because that, that we just have never had that. That's the first guy since Dominique to really say that. I mean, Joe Johnson was very good, but he wasn't superstar. So uh, I, I, like that's what that's what makes me think we have a chance. I mean, I think obviously Brooklyn, you know, you get three of those guys. Like they're going to be very, very hard for anybody to beat. West Co- Eastern Conference, Western Conference, no matter. Philly's really good. But I just think when you got a guy like Trey Young, you have very good players around him. You give yourself a chance. And it's not going to be easy, but look what Miami did last year, you know. You get, you get a Jimmy Butler playing really well. You have a bunch of Bam out of bio play as well. You never know. So I think this is the first time that since I've been alive where – I'm really excited, and I think we have a chance to, if we play our best basketball, to maybe upset a Philly. Like, are we going to go to the finals? Probably not. But, you know, we can make some noise here. Yeah, I mean, I, I definitely think that the Hawks, you know, of all, like you said, of all times that, that, that I've been following the team, that I've been, you know, a fan of the team, uh, you know, it's, it, it's definitely the most exciting um, that it's ever been. There, there's absolutely no doubt about that. Um, you know, when you have that top level talent, I mean, it's just the sky's the limit. And we haven't seen Trey Young in the playoffs, um, you know, so we don't know what he really, you know, can do, how teams can pick on him, how he can pick on other teams, you know, when you're really being able to game plan over and over and over uh, for the same team each game. Um, but I mean, it's, it's going to be exciting. I'm pumped to find out that, you know, both stadiums are going to be not full, uh, <laughs> but pretty close to. Um, I think the Knicks are going to have like 13 and a half, the Hawks are going to have around 10. Um, ten thousand. So it's, it's, did it they should upgrade be. the Knicks? Did they upgrade the Knicks? Yeah, Madison Square Garden is going to have. Uh, I think the most recent announced was thirteen thousand five hundred. Oh, really? Um, the, so I, it's going to be. Was, it's going to be a loud place. When I yeah, when I was on ESPN, it was like they were only allowing like you know 10, 10 or fifteen percent, and the Hawks were forty three. But I mean, I, yeah. I don't care. I like I like that. I, I want more people. On. Oh, I, I, think, I think when I you got a guy like Trey, yeah, absolutely. I think when you have a guy like Trey Young. Um, I do think, you know, you know, we said about the media and stuff in general. I think Trey is about as uh, media driven and social media driven as a player as there is. So, you know, if I'm going to be confident in anybody, uh, you know, scaling their, ga- scaling their game up to the playoffs when the stakes are at their highest, uh, you know, Trey cares about what people think about him. And, uh, you know, that can be a bad thing if you let it get to your head on a bad night. But I, I feel pretty confident that Trey's going to get out there and put on a show at the Garden. Uh, maybe have a Steph Curry garden moment uh, back when he was uh, back when he was a younger guy, but obviously no better time to do it in the playoffs. But we'll see, we'll see what Thibodeau lose, draws up for him. I, me and Jeff would lose our minds if we watch yeah. a Steph. We, 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 we watch a, if we watch a Trey Young Curry moment in the garden, and he just goes oh. off on the boys. <laughs> I, I won't be able to contain myself. I might People be drunk the for end a week. <laughs> yeah, they, they definitely, they definitely, they definitely won't hear the end of it. I, like I'll be talking. We might lose four one, but if he draws. 55 in the garden, 55 and 10. <laughs> well, and, you know, you're saying that, like, that is the cool thing about the series is, like, the Hawks, while they won to make the playoffs this year, it's not championship or bust. It's not like some of the other teams, you know, in the league where, like, the Hawks, it, I know they're playing the Knicks and they have a chance to win and we want to win, they want to win the series, but it's not like a, it's not an all in or nothing type of series. It's kind of a, they've already, they've kind of already made it. However, I do love that the Hawks themselves are not acting that way. And I think that's really important for the series coming up. Yeah, it is kind of like icing on the cake, but I, I mean, I don't know. I don't feel like that. I guess that's just who I am. Like I'm always just like, I guess I get too over emotional in these situations. Like <laughs> I, I really want to kill these dudes. No, so, like, we want, we want all the smoke. We want that's all what I'm saying. Like, we got to wake like, them up. We got to wake them up. Yeah, sleep I, yeah. I mean like, yeah. Cause I mean like the fact, like this is the thing like, okay. I would take like the playoffs as like a, like, let's say we got the six seat. And we're playing Milwaukee. I'd be like, all right, like playoffs, like that's nice. Like, you know, okay, all 16 people picked against the Hawks. Like, I get it. But like, we got the scrub Knicks. (laughs) Like, literally (laughs) the worst. We got the scrubs of the East. And we had 14 out of 16 people pick against us. Analysts. Like, no, like that ain't like that ain't enough. Now, now, now playoffs ain't enough. I need at least <laughs> I need at least a first round win because I am not going down like that. And I, I like right. listen, if I'm the Hawks and I'm looking at their roster, come on. Like they they should think that they're about to win this series and they should be upset if they don't win this series. Philadelphia, you know, icing on the cake. Icing on the cake. You know, that's that's if you win that, holy shit. This series, 
nah, like we got to win this series. I think another big thing with like the national media and all that, that I'm really like confused is a talking point this week. And it kind of proves to me they don't watch the Hawks. It's this whole, oh, you know, the Knicks, they're the more experienced team out of the two. I'm like, yeah, Derrick Rose has been in the playoffs a little bit. He's been in the playoffs. Tibbs is coaching playoff games, but then what? Like, I don't think nobody, right. <laughs> yeah, I mean, like, if you want to go there, like, Capella's been in the playoffs. Gallinari's been in the playoffs a few yeah. times. Like, we got some players that have been in the playoffs. And, like, above above all, like, I know Bo Dodimich hasn't been in the playoffs, but that guy just strikes me as a dude. Like, he's not going to flinch. Like, he's ice. Like, he's ice cold. I, I really don't think he's going to flinch. And I don't think Trey's going to flinch. Uh, just like I don't think Julius Randle's going to flinch. But, uh, right. you know, I, I think it's going to come down to role players in this series. And – Unless Derrick Rose goes vintage Derrick Rose on us, which I'm not saying it's not possible. He's been fantastic this year. I love what he's done, and I love Derrick Rose. So I'm not saying it's not possible, but I think that's what it's going to take because other than that, we got more guys that aren't going to flinch, and I'm very, very positive of that. Oh, no. I mean, the, the thing is, you know, like I, I said it earlier, the Hawks have three betters better than the Knicks' second best. I think R.J. Barrett's having a phenomenal year. Like you said, Derrick Rose can have a great series. But uh, but I think I'll take Bogdanovich, Capella, and Collins. I'll trust those guys more than I will second year RJ Barrett to uh, to be the difference maker in a in a tight game down the stretch. Yeah, I mean, I, yeah, Barrett has had a really nice year. I kind of keep. Oh, he has I'm absolutely. Not trying, I'm not trying to gloss over him because I think like the development that he's had shows that he's going to be a star in this league. I never i I thought he had the potential to be a 40 percent three point shooter. Not in year two, you know, like not <laughs> after he shot at Duke. So I've I've been really impressed with him, but. You know, I still think he gets streaky at times. I think, you know, I think he can get, you know, he can get down on himself. I think that's easy to do in the playoffs. And I think that's going to be tough for him to, like, keep up unless he gets hot from the get-go, which he could, which he could. Right. Um, they do have a couple other guys that I, you know, I'm a little bit worried. Alec Burks has played really good basketball. Um, Reggie, Reggie Bullock. Bullock doesn't miss. <laughs> um, yeah. You know, so those guys are all shooting. Like I, like I said, I mean, this is a 3 and D team. I mean, they're a real team. And they're going to be relying on that three-point shot. And they're going to have to hit a lot of them. Uh, so if the Hawks defend the three point line, I mean, if I like, so let's let's get into this. How would you attack defending Julius Randle? Because that's you got to shut him down, but you also can't just let these guys, these three point shooters, get into a groove. And he's a great passer. Uh, so, who wants it? Jeff, go for it. Yeah, I'm thinking. I mean, you, of course, you got to throw bodies at him. Like, I'm thinking <laughs> matchup wise, you're probably going to throw hundred out there, some, mix some Capella in there a little bit. I guess Collins could be help side a little bit, but you got to just kind of, yeah. I mean, I think my whole thing is kind of just the hope, the hope and the, not even the hope, just the realization. I just don't think they are a three and D team, but I just don't think over the duration of a seven game series kind of with the adjustments being made and everything, that the Knicks are going to be able to shoot 40% from three. So if you can throw some bodies at Julius kind of play him physical, make him work for his buckets, take them long contested twos and step back threes. Let the chips fall as they may. He, if he gets his, he gets his. But I just don't think he'll – I think that'll be enough to at least curve like what he was doing against us this year, not putting up no 37, 38 a game. Oh, yeah, absolutely. What, I think you, I think they'll go – I think they'll go – if Hunter is as healthy as we hope he is, I, I think on paper that would be, you know, kind of the way you'd want to go. I'm pretty interested to see if the Knicks stick with Alfred Payton, who has been pretty horrible uh, mm. for the past, uh, saw, the past few games. They, they said that they were. Yeah, Tim's uh, saying his yeah, rotation is rotation. Yeah, he's going to run with mm-hmm. it. I mean, Which it, I think it's what we got back to earlier. Defensive. Right. I mean, when they when they go, I mean, when they're playing their guys 40 minutes a night, I mean, that it's it's classic Tibbs. He's he's going to play every game like it's playoff basketball. So I don't know how many adjustments he's, he's really going to make to his rotation, like y'all said. Um, you know, if Alfred Payton's on the court, I think it's pretty interesting whether or not you put uh, – whether or not you put Trey Young on, on Alfred uh, – I think uh, they might be better off uh, having Trey just kind of follow Reggie Bullock, and Reggie's going to get some shots off screens, and he's going to be bigger than him. But Reggie's not exactly someone who scares you off the bounce. Off the bounce, I think you put somebody like Collins off of off of Alfred Payton when he's on the court. Have Collins be able to, be able to ready to help with Hunter if, if Julius really kind of gets to his uh tries to get to his right, get to his left, and try to get downhill. Um, and I think somebody proposed it, and uh, you know I, I thought it was interesting, but. Down the stretch, the Knicks have a big tendency to uh, to just go hero ball, <laughs> give the ball to Julius, and and basically pray. Um, I think that is a scenario where, although I, I really obviously love Clint Capella's off ball defense, and that's what he's great at is jumping in, blocking shots, and getting rebounds. 
I think that's where he can really, you know, make an impact is, you know, down the stretch those last three, four, five minutes. Putting Capella in that big body on Julius and really making him work uh, can can come in huge because Nerlens Noel is a big boy and uh, and he'll definitely go and go and get his rebounds without a doubt. But I think Collins can do good enough uh, keeping him, you know, off the offensive glass to be able to put Capella on him down the stretch. I think that's the way uh, that I would go. But again, I'm not an NBA coach paid to make those decisions, so we'll see what Nate does. <laughs> That'd be great uh, to yeah. find out. We'll see. Yeah, I mean that's why I'm so excited for Sunday. One of the many reasons, but. Yeah, I think early on you kind of probably, you know, you at least see what Hunter can do, see if he can slow him down. Um, if he's doing well, you stick with it. Um, I don't really think Collins is the answer. Right. Uh, and I don't think you can stick Clint Capella out there for a full, you know, game. One, that's going to wear yeah. him down. Two, you want him grabbing boards and defending the paint. Um, I think big, big thing, you, you obviously got to defend the three-point line. You don't want any of these shooters to get going because that's like you said, JJ. I don't. I don't think they're going to shoot forty percent from three, especially if you're playing good defense. But if you let them get going and you let them get open shots and like you let them start feeling, you let these role players start feeling them, especially on their home floor. You know that's how you get in some trouble. Yeah. So I think you know defending the three point line is 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 almost bigger than letting Julius Randall get his. You know, if Jul- Julius Randall is making hard shots and getting to the bucket and making twos, I can live with that uh, as long as you're not letting these other guys get hot. Um, But I think I agree with you. I think I was one thing I was really impressed and I didn't know if he could do it. But, you know, the third game, there were a lot of times where Clint Capella was getting switched on to Julius. And you could almost tell like when anyone else was on Julius one on one, it was like, oh, it's go time. But when Clint Clint Capella got that switch, it was like, oh, who do I pass it to? Because like he did like because Clint Capella, even on the perimeter, I mean, he is one of the best defenders in the NBA. He's got quick feet and it's not like Julius is this super fast guard that's going to like break his ankles you know I mean he's got good moves but I think it's a good matchup for Clint so I think I do think down the stretch that's definitely an option I think we will see that because I think there's gonna be a lot of close games in this series and I think that is a, a good opportunity to make that switch and I think you can Collins can get enough boards and the rebound to where you're not too worried about it and it's not like like you said if they had Mitchell Robinson I think that scares you a little bit more right um, but uh, without Mitchell Robinson, I think you can go to Capella in those late game situations and uh, make things difficult for him. But I think, yeah, I think I agree with JJ. I think you start with uh, Hunter. He's probably your most physical guy that can handle the perimeter. And uh, then you make adjustments from there. Hopefully he can slow him down. But I think the big thing is just not letting these other guys get going. If you don't let them get going, uh, as much hero ball as Capella can play, if you're playing hard defense, I don't think he's going to go out there and, and get 40 a night. And uh, even if he gets forty, I think the Hawks have enough offense to win. So oh yeah, you want you want to make this an offensive game. I mean, the Hawks, the Hawks have you know obviously a lot of a lot of great players. Uh, you know they've got they've got a couple guys that can defend, but ultimately the the Hawks win this series by getting out there and, and scoring. And uh, you know they're 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 going to get out there, they're going to get theirs, and uh, you just can't let the Knicks can't let the Knicks score more <laughs> score more than 110, 120 points because. Uh, you know, they're just – they're not that great of an offense. I mean, they were 23rd in the NBA in offensive rating for a reason. Um, I think when the when Nate can get out there and actually game plan, it's going to be tough for them to get buckets outside of Julius. Yeah, I mean, and they were getting 110, 120 on us in every game, which is why they went 3-0 and because they are a great right. defensive team. Um, I guess Absolutely. the other big matchup that we have to talk about, and it's kind of from the other perspective, but, uh, you know, I'll start with you, Jeffrey. I mean, if you're Tom Thibodeau, how are you approaching guarding Trey Young? And, you know, the Hawks shooters, because it's obviously not just Trey Young. We got guys that can score off of him. Um, but I, I don't think, I really don't think, even Alfred Payton, who's a great defender, I don't think there's a, a guy in this league who can defend that Trey Young one-on-one and have success. Yeah, no, I don't think anyone in the league can, like, one-on-one defend Trey Young like that. I do think Alfred, they'll initially throw him out there, see what he can do, throw some, uh, they might throw some, uh, I feel like they're, they're going to definitely try to be physical on him, because, I mean, You've you've heard their viewpoints all all the time. It's like we're gonna try to take away his uh, ability to get to the free throw line. They made a big emphasis on not trying to foul him at the three point line. Um, and I know just kind of based off Tibbs and Tibbs type teams, I try to rough him up here and there, rough him up what they can under the whistle. And we kind of we kind of know we know just like Nate knows, the raps are gonna be swallowing their whistles all series. Yep. But uh, yep. I'm like I, personally, I just don't really see. As long as Trey's on his game, I don't really see anybody on their team who can guard him like that. 
No. I mean, he's definitely going to get passed. He's going to get past the first defender. He does that all the time. And then it's how you defend from there. And then he's going to find – and he's going to make the right plays. I think uh, yeah. – Really, it's just like with Trey, it's about efficiency. You know, he has those stretches in games where he just makes too many mistakes. Um, I do think he can get a little emotional in games, which is why that kind of worries me because I do think, like you said, they're going to be physical with them. They have to be. And, and and it's playoff basketball. Make make the referees make the calls. And I don't think the Hawks are going to get nearly as many calls, especially Trey Young, as they do, do during the regular season, which – you know, could frustrate him. And I think a big part of this series is going to be his mindset and not letting that affect him and just pushing forward and pushing forward, understanding, you know, I got teammates around me. And, uh, you know, I think there is going to be a time in the series where he maybe starts thinking about, stops thinking about scoring himself and really just is like, I'm going to be a pure facilitator. My guy's got me. And uh, I think that's when the Hawks are really going to start playing well. Yeah. Yeah. Like you when, see, you see, um, oh, sorry, JJ. No, you, you're good. You're good. Uh, you know, you see something where like you watch the, I, I don't know if y'all were able to tune in, but the, the Lakers Warriors game last night where you see, uh, you see Steph, as soon as he crosses half court, he's getting mauled by two people and they're passing off to Draymond. He's having to make that secondary kind of play. Um, the thing about the Hawks, you know, again, credit to Travis Schlink. We started off the podcast with it, drill pass shoot. Um, you know, that's what he, he wants to find in guys and that's what he's got. I mean, if, if Trey, I feel pretty confident, you know, when they come up to double, if they want to trap, if they don't want to let the Hawks kind of get in their pick and roll stuff, I feel pretty confident putting the ball in Bogdanovich and, and Herter and, and Hunter's hands, you know, to play make. Uh, it obviously also hit open threes. Probably, I think the Knicks may try to force John Collins to be a little bit more of a playmaker. Um, he's shown flashes and, and he does have a big to big ability to pass and he will throw lobs to Capella every once in a while. But I think if I'm Thibodeau, um, you know, I'm, I'm not leaving Bogdanovich open. Uh, I'm, I'm probably not leaving Hunter open. Maybe they, you know, try to make him beat him since he's been on such a long hiatus. But I think we're going to see Collins get the ball a lot in that kind of like that middle kind of like secondary playmaking role to where he's either running like secondary pick and roll. He's running, you know, kind of kind of base reads of shoot or, or, or dump to Clint Capella. And, you know, that's going to be a big difference. That's why my bold prediction that I put in, in that article we put up, I think John Collins is going to, you know, average a good bit of points. I think he's going to be over 22, which is about four over his season average. But we'll see. I think I, you, you don't let Trey Young beat you if you're the Knicks. Whatever you do, you don't let him go out there and average 40. Um, make the other guys do it. I think the Hawks have the guys to do it. But we'll see. Yeah, I and, think. Uh, yo, go for it. I guess, like, yeah, like me and you were talking about this weekend, Chase. Like, I'm really excited for people to see the maturation of Trey in this series. <laughs> Right. Kind of. Yeah. Last year, you know, I, I a lot of I got to get mine. The offense is all me. Like if we, I'm not doing anything, we're not going nowhere. And just to actually have legitimate secondary, like secondary playmakers in Bogdanovich, DeAndre Hunter taking a step up this year, showing he got some little playmaking ability. John Collins continue to adapt his game. He's showing a little bit more playmaking ability, too. I like I have good faith kind of in us being able to do what we got to do on offense. Like and just even guys off the bench, you know, Lou Will can come in, play, make a little bit. Gallinari, if he's on top of his game, he can do a little bit here and there. Like, it's I I I see tough sledding for the Knicks. Kind of, it's tough sledding. It's kind of you're damned if you do, damned if you don't. Yeah, I think, and that's one thing in a lot of the athletic articles that I've read about Trey and you know from Bogey and just just little you know quotes, even in just random articles, is it, talking about the maturation of Trey. I mean, they really, I mean, the, the veterans, Bogey, Gallo. They really feel like over this like stretch, you know, especially under Nate McMillan, he's kind of figured out when to say, hey, this is my time. Hey, I need to like back it up. You know, let's facilitate. Let's get these guys involved. You know, it's it, it, the game's slowing down for him. I think you can tell that. And I, I, yeah, like I think that's that's something I'm excited to see. But will it speed up for him when, you know, it's crunch time? You know, this is obviously the playoffs and you're playing the number one defensive team, you know. Is there going to be a panic button? Is he going to be able to stay that calm the whole time? I think that's that's a big question. I think if you're looking at a way the Hawks lose this series, that's probably, you know, how. Is if Trey kind of gets off his game, he lets uh, the officiating, you know, get him off his game for whatever reason, you know, you know, he gets in a shooting slump. You know, he's got it. Like he is he, – without Trey, this team is nothing. You know, and I'm, we all know that, but it, it's – you know, it doesn't even matter if Trey's shooting 37% or 52, you know, what he does, the way he runs the offense, the way he creates for his, for his teammates, you know, that's really the important, the important aspect of what he brings without him, you know, this team, you know, they struggles an incredible amount. 
So, uh, you know, I think if you're looking at a way the Hawks can lose this series, it's, you know, letting the officiating get to them, letting a slump get to them, you know, and, and, and you, you can't give up those opportunities and every game is so pivotal. So uh, I hope, I hope that maturation carries over. It's certainly promising over the last, you know, 30 games, but I don't think it's a guarantee, especially like in this moment. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's so. Uh, anyways, the, uh, this, here's the question that I wanted to ask leading, you know, talking about the officiating uh, Trey's averaging, I think 9.3, 9.3 uh, free throws a game. And he's done that pretty much for the last two years. So over the last, you know, 140 games, he's getting up the free throw nine to 10 times. Officiating is obviously going to be harder. Uh, I think they're going to make a point of those little flop fouls almost, you know, where he gets someone on his ass and like, you know, pumps. What's the over under? Like, if I set the over under at, let's just set it right at seven. Is he going over or under free throws for the series? Per game, obviously. I'm going to go. I'm, I, I, know, I completely agree. The, the referees are going to be swallowing their whistles. They're going to be a lot of less of ticky tack stuff. I'm still going to lean over just because I think it's just such a big part of Trey's game. And I do also think that while he may not get kind of the smaller, uh, you know, like I said, ticky tack kind of fouls, Thibodeau is going to want to beat Trey up. I mean, Nate McMillan actually even said today, you know, if he were guarding Trey back in the day, that'd be one of the things he'd do. I think Trey's pretty durable and, and, and Trey is – stronger than uh than he looks he's obviously pretty slight but you know he does take a beating i think that uh you know the knicks are going to make it a point to to kind of not let him get to those easy looks get to his floater as easily um and i i think i would still lean over it could because of course we also know at the end of the game there's nobody else are going to be passing that ball to when the hawks are up seven and the knicks are fouling um yeah. but yeah i think i would still lean i think i would still lean over on that although i could 100 percent see a world where Trey's falling on the court and looking for a foul that he would normally get. And now we're in transition and, uh, and giving up a bucket and we're getting frustrated. So uh, yeah. I think I'd lean over, but that's uh we can see either one. What about you, JJ? I'm going to lean with the over too. kind of on the flip side of the McMillan thing. I do kind of like him putting the seeds in there, kind of mentioning, you know, rap's going to be kind of pro Knicks NBA wanting to see this. I think that could potentially help us in this or help at least Trey in the series kind of get to the line, get a couple more calls and he would have potentially gotten in the first place. But, I mean, at the end of the day, would that just be in, like, his game and as heavy as it is? Do I think he'll be hitting the 9, 10 free throw attempts a game? No. But I think if he can at least get at least 8. Just him getting to the cup. You like And kind of like Christian and you were saying, Chase, I don't think he'll get some of those bump fouls he gets. But just with how, like, creating fouls is so intertwined in his game, I do think he'll be the over with 7. Yeah, I mean, I guess I'd have to go the over because he's – putting up over nine and maybe me being, the, maybe I'm just a bad Vegas. Maybe I should have made it like, eight. <laughs> Who knows? but, uh, but uh, yeah, I mean, I guess I should probably go over. So, you know, Vegas don't have the over is always more fun anyway. So, <laughs> but um, another thing I wanted to ask as we kind of, you know, get to the end of the topics and we, we talked a lot about all the Hawks pieces, but you know, if you had to bet on one guy in this series, who's going to be that, Robin to Trey's Batman. Who's it going to be? I mean, is it John Collins? Is it Bogdanovich? Is it Capella? I think I kind of like don't want to count Capella because Capella's like just like a he's like a different entity. He's like he's the defense of <laughs> like I'm going to catch lobs. Like it's like he's going to get his. Like he, you can't right. stop him. He's just huge and athletic. Like there's no stopping that man. Like he's the biggest man on the course. So like let's like not count Capella. But like who offensively like you need the buckets. Like they're double teaming Trey. Like, who's going to be that guy? Is it going to be Hunter? Like, maybe he starts having a big series. It's going to be Bogdanovich, Collins. You know, who do you see being that guy? Yeah, yeah, go for you it. You got it. All right, yeah. So, I was tempted. You know, I was kind of thinking about this week. I was tempted to go with Collins, kind of hedge for my initial Bogdanovich thought. But I, I still think Bogdanovich is going to be that guy. That guy has been on such a tear the second half of this season. Kind of with them just giving him the opportunity he has off ball. And I figure – He'll continue to have those opportunities this series because I know the Knicks are going to put a strong focus on Trey and his just Bogdanovich with his like secondary playmaking ability and ability to get his and just be able to go with the flow of the offense. I'm thinking like I'm seeing a big series coming from him this week. I mean, upcoming. Yeah. Trisha? I I think uh I think uh, you know, I, I definitely agree. Bogdanovich make a lot of plays, but let me throw a name out there. 
uh, Tony Snell. I'm not just kidding. Uh, <laughs> um, as great dude. as he's been, I mean, what a story. Just what a story real quick. Tony Snell, guy has, dude. Guy hasn't missed t- a free throw in two years. <laughs> like, how's that, that even possible? Funny- <laughs> and I get it's like 100 free throws, but like, or like 90 free throws, <laughs> but like, he's literally just out there sinking everything. He shot 53, 56, 100. Like, what? I swear he hasn't missed the three all season. I, I, I remember talk about that for a second. Let's talk about that. Yeah, for a no, no, no. that's actually a good point. Uh, yeah, I mean, what role does Tony Snell have in the series? Is he a serious bench piece? I mean, are they giving him good. Mem- How many minutes is he getting? Yeah, I mean, I, 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 I want to take back the. Uh, I wrote a uh, projecting the playoff minutes uh, <laughs> like two or three weeks ago, and I think looking back over that, I, I'd like to you know change a couple things, but. McMillan doesn't seem to want to go further past nine. And I mean, you look at the bench, you, you got Lou Williams, Danilo Gallinari. Um, you know, Herter. if you're looking at a guy, Herter, yeah. Hurt, Kevin Herter, of course, absolutely. Is that Solomon Hill? Is it Tony Snell? Is it a Kongwu? Do they go to 10 to do a combination of those guys? I, I think I mean, right now, Snell. yeah, I, w- I would lean, I would lean Snell just for the fact of, you know, you can't really replace that shooting. It obviously is, uh, <laughs> it's been pretty beneficial. Um, I think he'll, he'll get five, six, seven, you know, I, I don't think it's going to be anything crazy. Cause again, you're going to want Bogdanovich and Hunter out there, but it really does come down to the health of Hunter. If Hunter isn't back the way we hope he is and the way Hawks fans hope he is, well, I think we'd see a, a, a decent amount of Snell. Um, otherwise I think it's going to be kind of a more of a, a into quarter into the first and into the third kind of, kind of role for him. Yeah. Well, that tells you just all you need to know about this Hawk staff. And you have a guy shooting yep. 50, yep, 50, yep, 100. Yep. And we're like, uh, I don't even know if he's going to play. Uh, and you, I mean, you can laugh at that. Like, obviously, it's not big points, big minutes, but I mean, fifty that you can't you can't sneeze at that. Like, that's that's ridiculously good. And the fact that we're like not even going to play him, or like we will probably play him a little, but he's not going to get many minutes at all. I mean, this is a guy that was playing like thirty two minutes for Milwaukee, like in the playoffs, oh, like back in the day. So you know, like the depth is just ridiculous. Um, uh, I, I guess we're going to talk about this in a second, so I'm, I'm not going to cover that, but. Uh, I want to go back to you, Christian. I mean, who, who is it going to be that second guy? Because I assume you don't honestly think it's going to be Tony Snow. <laughs> That'd be really cool, though. That'd be really awesome. Uh, no, I mean, he no, I think I, it. <laughs> I think I think I'm still going to go uh, with John Collins. I think I, I feel pretty good. He's he's the most veteran, you know, uh, of the um, of the younger kind of group. Obviously, Bogdanovich and Capella are full on veterans. I mean, we're not, they're not young guys by any means. Um, but I, I do feel like Bogdanovich is going to get the attention he deserves. I think uh, I think you know DeAndre Hunter may have a may have a pretty decent series, but I mean John Collins is uh, he, we're, they're going to need his offense. They're going to need him to be able to secondary play make, be able to make shots. Who would have thought three years ago that John Collins would be the shooter that he is right now? Um, you know I think with John Collins, I think you know again kind of like I, what I talked about earlier. I think is his secondary play making. You know off of uh, when Trey gets doubled, when they you know don't let Bogdanovich run off screens the way he's been. I think is going to be huge and. I just think he's going to have to have a big series. If the Haw- it, it, I envision that the Hawks, you know, do come out and win this series, uh, we're going to look back at John as the uh, second or third best player in this one, and um, you know, he's he's going to need to be because again, he's in his he's in his uh, was this his fourth year? He's in a contract year. He's got as much on the line as anybody. I don't think anybody's not playing hard. It's the playoffs, but if anybody's got a little extra pep in their step, it's going to be John Collins. Yeah, so I'm right there with you guys. I think it's. I think it's John Collins, it's Bogdan Magdanovich. Those are the two obvious answers. I do want to give some credit to Gallinari because I could see if that guy gets hot, I mean, there's no stopping that man. I mean, he is a absolute microwave off the bench. So, And he can get hot for a seven-game stretch. I mean, so, I mean, he's the kind of guy who could change a series off the bench. So uh, I'm not totally counting him out. I like his veteran leadership. He's been here before. Uh, he's always seemingly on teams that overachieve. But uh, I think being that he's obviously not starting, he's probably going to get five or ten minutes less than these other two guys. I think it's between those two, and I'm I'm genuinely torn. I'm going to go with Collins, too, because I feel like he's just so undervalued. And I just think we look at his stats, um, and it's like 17-7, and and we haven't asked him to do that much. But I think in this series, in the playoffs, you know, you start turning to your best guys more and more often. And I look at who the real second best player on this roster is, and I'm like, that's John Collins. And I think that because of that, and I think he's a gamer, and, I, and like you said, he's got everything on the line as a, uh, as a guy that's in the contract here. And I, I think he's going to prove to a lot of people uh, what he's worth. Um, I'm trying to think like from the opposite end of the spectrum, like, like who you could see shrinking, but I don't even want to get into that. But one thing <laughs> that uh, 
uh, Christian, you mentioned it going like nine or 10 deep uh, on Yeke Okongwu. Um, this guy, uh, I thought for sure it was going to be a red shirt year pretty much. Mm -hmm. And next thing you know, he's out there playing fantastic, fantastic basketball and his like limited starts that we've had to have him um, in his backup role. I mean, he's out there. I mean, even his PER is up there to like 17. He's playing good defense. He's blocking shots. He's doing a little bit of everything. Really looking like the guy we thought when we drafted him. Do you think he's done enough in these last, since basically McMillan's taken over to insert himself, you know, even on a partial? Is it some guy, maybe you give him a chance in game one and if he struggles, you, you don't go back to it. You know, does he get a shot in this series? I think initially they, they might give him a couple minutes game. Yeah, kind of like you were saying, game one to feel it out. Maybe I don't per se see it be, being more than like 10 or so like in game one. Oh, yeah, but, I don't see it being a lot. But I mean, yeah, I, does, no. he, does he get a shot? I think he'll get a shot, yeah, to initially start off the series. It might fill him out. I can see as we get deeper into the series, probably kind of like you guys were saying, go like nine deep and primarily a backup center. It'd be Gallinari, like the backup five, or they'll shift columns to the five, kind of throw another lineup out there. But I can definitely see kind of the first two games, potentially him getting some minutes. They feel it out, see how he goes, and see if he can be a rotation. I mean, part of the rotation for the rest of the series. Christian, what about you? Yeah, I, I think, you know, I, Clint, the thing about Clint Capella that – that and I'm, and we know we're talking about a Kongu, but it kind of goes – Clint Capella is one of, you know, one of the better condition big men in the NBA, and you see a lot of times guys get run off the court. I know when he was in Houston, he had trouble late in series. The Knicks don't present the same problems the Golden State Warriors do. So I think Capella is going to be a pretty up there in minutes. So I, I think you project him around 30, 32 minutes a night. So there's about 16 minutes on the table there. I, I think most of those do just go to John Collins because – you know, Gallo. when you're projecting, yeah, when you're projecting whether or not a Kongwu is going to play, you're actually really asking, does he play over Gallo or Collins? And I, I don't see much. I think they do give him a shot because honestly, he's a sleeper pick for who you would want to put on Randall. I mean, if you're building mm -hmm. a guy in a lab, in yeah. theory, a Kongwu exactly. means six eight, six nine, good feet, strong. He presents problems for Randall because he's not a mismatch anyway, but he's a rookie. So I, I don't know how much I'd really trust him. I think there's a chance he gets a couple minutes to show something, but. I wouldn't bank too much. I think he's had a really, really solid rookie campaign. I'm looking forward to what he does next year for sure. Yeah, I think those are all great points, especially the Randall point. He's kind of like if you're building a guy in a lab who could, you know, yeah. guard the guy on the perimeter. I, I think it would be on at Congo. I think this is kind of his role. I don't know if he immediately gets, you know, a couple minutes um, here and there just as like a, a rotational member. I think they'll probably try to keep that pretty tight. Um, maybe they do, maybe they don't. I, I wouldn't be against it either way. But I do think, you know, as, as a coach, as Nate McMillan, you, you can tell guys like John Collins and Clint Capella and DeAndre Hunter, not necessarily like, hey, man, go get in foul trouble, but, you know, be physical. Like, because we got, got other guys that can, right. like, we can, like, if we have to bring him in, like, we can. Like, you know, it's like an extra weapon that, like, we got to pull this tool out of our tool belt. You know, he's there. And, and you trust him enough to wear that, you know, you know, make sure, you know, make, don't give them easy stuff, at least, you know, in the first half. So if you get a couple fouls on you, like on Yeke, a Kongu can come in and, you know, fill in those minutes at the end of the half, something Definitely. like that. I think that's kind of the role that you see him in and, I, and I'm perfectly happy. And I think that's just another example of the amount of depth. I mean, dude, we got a six overall pick that hasn't even touched the surface of what he could be. And he's just chilling. I, we don't even need him, you know? I mean, it's just crazy how much potential this team really does have. So I'm really excited, and I think this is going to be a fantastic series. And I want to get you guys now your series prediction. I'm sure we're all leaning one way. I don't know which way it is. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> Nixon four, yeah, right. <laughs> but, JJ, uh, I'll start with you. Like, you know, what, what are you thinking? Seven games, who, who you got? I got Hawks in six. I say we come to New York. We take game one on Sunday. They'll take two. We come back to Atlanta. They're not going to be us in Atlanta. Run three and four. And Knicks will, you know, we won't gentlemen sleep them. They'll get game five, and then we'll come back, wrap it up in Atlanta, <laughs> and, you know, <laughs> we're on to Philly. Yeah, we're on to Philly. Christian, go ahead. Yeah, I, I think Hawks and six is definitely going to be the I, – I, that's, you know, most responsible. I think that's the one I'm definitely on, uh, like exactly like Jeffrey. It'd be, it'd be uh, pretty crazy to think that the Knicks don't squeak out a game or two. Um, seven game series stuff happens. I know. Yeah, I, I can't wait. Here it comes. But, yeah, I mean, I, I'm gonna say Hawks in six. Uh, because I, 
I mean, I think they're the better team, and I think they're going to win the games at home when it matters. Yeah, so, I mean, I like I wrote a whole <laughs> prediction, and I picked Hawks in six. But because I have yeah. to be different, and there's no way I'm going Hawks in seven, I'll go Hawks in five. Because I think these guys are bums. <laughs> And right. we're going to smoke them up and down the court. <laughs> and these New York people are going to be crying left and right. And Atlanta's finally going to get an ounce of respect. Actually, shit, we ain't going to get no respect. They're going to be like, yeah, oh, yeah, you yeah. don't get ahead of you yourself on that <laughs> You just beat the Knicks. They scrubs like Sixers right. and four. That's what I'm going to hear like for the next week. But, you know, I, yeah, I mean, I think five or six games. I don't think it goes to seven. If it goes to seven, I think the Hawks are in a tiny bit of trouble. I'd still like them. But, you know, going into Madison Square Garden in the game yeah. seven, that's definitely not a situation not you want right. to be in. So if we get the opportunity to clinch in six, hopefully that happens. Uh, I see a lot of people saying Hawks in seven, and I'm just like, what? Like, I mean, if it gets to seven, like, it's, that's like me a scary ass game. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so I agree. I think Hawks in six is the best way, but I'll go Hawks in five because I, I do think we're a significantly better team, and I think we're going to win this game. And, uh, you know, that that's how I feel. I'm really pumped. I'm, I'm pumped. I'm pumped. I'm pumped. And, I think we'll probably do this next week, probably after game two. So we'll have a better feel of how this series goes. And, you know, that pretty much wraps it up for the first episode of Squawk Talk. And I, this was fun. I loved it. I can't wait to get back for game two. Hopefully we're up 2-0. I'm hopefully we're not knocked down 0-2. <laughs> but you never, hey, right. you never know. You're down right. but not out, baby. But, you know, that Absolutely. wraps it up for the first episode of Squawk Talk. I'm you know, really glad you guys listened. And go Hawks.